If these walls could talk, they would speak of a man who has worked with great heart to accomplish his plan. They'd speak of the times that he prayed in the night for the strength to go on and to do what is right. They'd speak of sweet moments. The most lifelong memory of mother is how she always dressed. Everything always matched from head to toe, pressed crisply and stylish. She always put her best foot forward. She is greatly missed. What hurt the worst was when she would realize that her memories were gone. It would only be for a few moments, but in those moments of clarity, we would sit together in tears. There's so many misconceptions and uh, I think that sometimes the behaviors are frightening to people but I've learned so much from examining my mother's behavior and the research I've received. Any behavior that is untoward is because of an unmet need. We talk about how do you tell someone about your diagnosis, what do you say, who do you tell, would you tell them again. My grandmother, she always did what she needed to do to take care of her family. Irregardless of what was going on, she always threw herself in the brunt of everything. I remember a lot of it. I remember her garden and how big her garden was because my grandmother definitely had a green thumb. She could plant anything, she could grow anything, she could take care of anything. And she had animals, she had geese, chickens, she had it all. And as little girls, we would run into the backyard, through the garden, barefoot. When it was summertime and we wanted a watermelon, all we had to do was go out to the garden, get a watermelon, bring it in, cantaloupe, whatever you wanted, you name it, she was growing it. Mother died in 2001, and I still recall uh, the tremendous love and support that uh, she had for us. She had a very troubled childhood. Her, both of her parents committed suicide, but she didn't use any of that to create uh, barriers. She just was full of love. Probably about 2009, my mom by this point, I had become a nurse. I, I was very familiar with dementia and the various types of dementia and how it impact, impacts families. I had just experienced with my dad, his grandfather having dementia and living next door to us um, as a high schooler, but still didn't quite understand it and didn't really get the whole understanding until after going to nursing school and going into the nursing profession and then actually having to be the director over a dementia unit where I had to go through special dementia training just to be able to take care of patients that had this condition and the different types of condition. And so in dementia, I've seen so many different sides to it. And about 2009, my mom, when she would talk to my grandmother, because she would talk to her at least once a week, she started to kind of pick up on some things and notice some things, and then she kind of started talking to me about it. And I just kind of brought it to her attention. I said, Mom, I said, it sounds like she might have some early signs of dementia. The part of the brain that's shrinking with Alzheimer's disease, that's causing much more shrinkage than the 10%. Uh, and with Alzheimer's disease, we believe it begins right here above the ears in something called the hippocampus. And it's kind of like having uh, a big photo album in your brain and you are um, losing the most recent pictures. Okay, like what did you eat for breakfast? All those things are gone. But you can look back 30, not you, 30 or 40 years and remember everything in really graphic detail. 
You know, it's, some, it's really incredible. It wasn't a week later. My mom got a call from us on and my grandmother had fallen again. They took her to the emergency room and they did not realize that in one of her falls, she had a bleed in her brain. It was a small bleed, probably not anything that would have really done much harm, but they started her on heparin through an IV, which led to that bleed that was a minor bleed to be a pretty massive bleed and swelling in her brain and my oma shortly went into a coma after that. It was August the 7th and uh, 2001 and I was coming to see them in Shreveport. I was so excited. My daughter was coming back from India with my two-year-old grandchild that she had adopted from one of Mother Teresa's orphanages. And I cleaned out my trunk and I had room for my mother's wheelchair and I was gonna surprise her, take her to see that baby get on the plane. So, I walked in, I was getting ready to go in the house and my dad had called me and said, your mom has on lipstick. That means she's gonna ask you if she can go to the airport. And I'd already told him, and he was just laughing because, you know, she didn't know that we had this secret planned. So I walk in the door, and uh, my mother is lying on the floor choking to death. My dad comes running in from the backyard as I'm coming in, and we both race to her, and uh, I can see that she's choking, and I'm unbuttoning her blouse. I'm getting ready to do chest percussions, and he pushes me away, and he said, no, she hasn't had anything to eat. I said, Dad, she's choking to death. He pushed me away, and she died. I know it's impacted me. I know it's impacted my kids and my husband because we were all also part of taking care of her, knowing her before everything took place with the dementia and then being there for her when all of that kind of took control over her. And so I take those memories and I add them to all my other memories of her when I was little and I miss her a lot she was funny and like I said she was just a spunky she was a spunky little lady even all the way up until she just she deceased and I think a lot of times a lot of my traits I get that from her I think my kids get a lot of those traits from her. I will always carry her memories and stuff with me 